Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Wisdom Chat. I'm Phil Holdsworth, founder of Aurum Gold and your host today. And my guest is the wonderful Sybil Solomon, uh, who is the creator of Money Habitudes, a financial tool that helps people understand uh, the psychology of money and make wiser financial decisions. Uh, Sybil's also works with financial planners, non-profits and the military, looking at both the financial prospects and how influences, how money influences right. our lives. Sybil, thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome. Well, thank you. It's lovely to be here and it's fun to be talking to people in the UK. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, you're from all the way over the pond, as they say. Yes. <laughs> <I am. laughs> um, so what what's wonderful is I, I use the money habitudes in the work that I do with my clients but it would be just nice to know from the creator what is money habitudes so Phil money habitudes is actually a real word and our habitudes are our habits and our attitudes and we don't know about we don't even know that they're there most of the time it's like our default They've developed over years and years of um, hearing things, experiencing things. We do things so many times we think they're automatic. And a lot of times people feel like they don't have control because they don't know the habits and attitudes that are motivating what they do. And once they realize what those habits and attitudes are, then if things aren't working the way they want them to, they can take control. They can change it. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because it just immediately reminds me of a story of a client I had who um, could, who always felt they could never achieve their financial goals and didn't understand why until in the course of conversation, I found that they were a, a spontaneous spender. In other words, they would see something they liked and they would buy it uh, and then feel that sense of regret afterwards, realizing, oh, I've just spent the money I was going to save for my holiday or whatever it may be. And they didn't recognize that part. So it's interesting you should you should mention that. What, what okay. sort of things have you um, come across with regards to um, these habitudes? Um, and what are these habitudes? What what examples m might you have there? Well, let me go back to what you were just saying, when somebody spends money and then afterwards they regret it. You know, sometimes that just happens once in a while. And, you know, it's OK to spend money on something and then say, oh, you know, I really didn't need it. It cost more than I should have spent on it. And sometimes we do that. And, and that's that's perfectly OK. But if you're finding that those types of things are happening repeatedly, even though you're saying you don't want them to happen, then you want to start looking at what's my pattern? Where did that come from? And until you can discover that, what most of us do is we, re we react in the moment and those are automatic habits and attitudes. And once we can predict the types of situations where we go to our default and where we act automatically and just react, then we could say, you know what? I want to respond differently. And then you start predicting, what are the situations? Is it when you're with a particular friend or relative that you tend to be very generous or you tend to be really cheap? Um, is it, you know, I know for myself, if I'm on vacation, I already know that I'm going to probably buy a ring or I'm going to buy some piece of jewelry. But in my head, I have an idea of how much I'm going to spend. Um, and I'm not going to spend 10 times that amount and then regret it. So, but for a while I used to feel guilty. Like, why, why am I just buying this jewelry? And then I realized that was my special treat and I wasn't overdoing it. So sometimes we regret things because maybe we feel guilty and we need to question, do we need to feel guilty? Were we okay with that? Or were we doing something where we really felt like we wasted our money and next time we don't want to do that. We want to put some things in place to stop us or avoid it. It's, it's interesting you say that because going back to what you said earlier about how these, um, these attitudes and these habits develop within us over many, many years. 
Um, I remember a story of a, a client who we were just having a general conversation about how uh, this particular person managed their finances. And they were very studious. They were very good. They knew what was coming in, what was going out. And I just happened to ask them, how often do you check your money? And uh, after a while, they eventually admitted several times a day. And I said, what are you afraid of? <laughs> and, uh, and this person just burst into tears, uh, which at that moment in time, I didn't expect. However, they began to recount the story of their relationship with an aunt as they were growing up. And the aunt would say to them, um, you must save. It's really important that you must save. And she found that uh, as, as she began to use her money, she found that she became guilty uh, or felt guilt, felt shame because she'd spent it, not saved it. So it's interesting what you're saying there about the, those influencers um, and, and what people feel they ought to do, which then is not them, really. It's almost like living by somebody else's uh, instructions or somebody else's values. Is, is that something you find quite common or um, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, it brings to mind a couple of things as you say that. Most of the time when we're talking about money, we automatically assume that people are having problems with saving money and that they, they're, they're struggling. And that certainly is something that we deal with a lot. But when it comes to emotions and money, it really has no bearing on how much money we have. One of my favorite stories is someone called and asked if I would coach them around money. And I automatically assumed, oh, they're having financial problems. Their problem was that they were always giving. And if they just met with somebody for lunch, they always felt not only did they need to pay for the lunch, but often they were involved with people in the community. They would write a check uh, to help support that organization. And after we talked about this for a while, what it turned out was this woman's father had been abusive and the mother had wanted to leave him and then couldn't because she financially couldn't afford to do that. But she was totally, totally on the daughter all the time that she had to get excellent grades and that she had to be, um, she was gonna have to achieve, right? And the daughter always felt like she wasn't loved right? She didn't, she was too young to remember that her father was abusive, right? And what she realized in the end from her brother was that the reason the mother was so hard on her was that she never wanted her to become dependent upon a man so that she couldn't leave a situation if she wanted to, right? And, but her takeaway from this was that she didn't realize that she just felt unloved. And when we don't feel loved, we have this big empty space in yeah. the middle of us and we hold on to our money often, um, or we try and buy love and we spend money that we shouldn't be spending. But what, what you were just saying in terms of how do we, how do we even get our habits and attitudes about money? Um, we get it from a few different sources. One is what you've already mentioned. We get it from our family. And yeah. some of those things are very overt. Our, our aunt, our mother, our father says, you have to save, right? And then there's the things that we observe, which are more important, is how do the people around us spend their money, treat their money? Um, and we take that in. And then we have inherited messages, you know, like, my dad was raised in poverty. I always had a roof over my head. I always had food, but I absorbed, inherited my father's poverty type of thing. And then we have our community. Who are the people around us? So one of the, uh, and, and what's acceptable, right? So yeah. one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit, if it's okay, is in the workplace. Please, right? please do so, uh, please. Yeah. So, money comes out in the workplace in a number of different ways. One is what's the influence of the people around you and how you spend money. One time I was working and everybody that I worked with, they bought their lunch every day in the cafeteria. And I brought my lunch with me. And someone said to me, why don't you just buy lunch? Why do you spend the time doing that? And 
I said, well, let's say that every day I spend $10 on lunch, right? That's $50 a week. That's $200 a month. That's over $2,000 in a year. I said, I want to travel. There's things that I love doing. I'd rather spend 10 minutes and make my lunch and spend $10, right? So the people around you, how do they dress? And with COVID, a lot of people have been working at home. They're saving a lot of money on clothes. <laughs> they're wearing <laughs> their sweatpants and you know their their uh, shirts. Uh, but you know, like if you're working in a place where where everybody talks about where they buy their shoes or you know where they go on vacations without even realizing it, you have to be pretty strong not to fit into that. Uh, so the culture that you work in, the culture you live in is really important. Um, but we know uh, in the UK, you have 94% of the people who are saying that they have money worries in, yeah. and 77% of those are saying that it's impacting their work. Yeah. And the question is like, why would their personal money impact their work, right? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question, but it's one that so many have identified as, as being one of the causes of things like um, presenteeism, people being present, but not really present. But, yeah. Ah, yes. Okay. So we actually have both. One is we have the absenteeism where people are literally not there because yeah. they're having to attend to things or, or they don't have the money to pay the baby to, to get somebody to watch your child if their child is sick. Um, so absenteeism, absenteeism is actually, and being tardy, um, both of those are very direct kinds of things. Uh, some things that might not be as evident is that there's studies that show that when you are chronically financially um, stressed that you function as if you're sleep deprived and when you're sleep deprived that's not a good way to be making decisions so some certainly, of the things that have, yeah again you certainly can't uh, problem solve can you in those circumstances that, that curtails that ability to problem solve right and so one of the things that has to do with problem solving is when you're sleep deprived, when you're feeling really stressed, you usually can only, and you're, you're facing a problem that needs to be solved, you usually can only think of one way to solve it, right? right. If it's your own problem. When, when you're feeling good and it's not your problem, you usually can think of seven different ways that you can approach problem solving. So in the workplace, people aren't, not only aren't they able to come up with a lot of their own um, options to solve a problem, but they're probably not as open to others. When people are really tired and sleep deprived, they may look okay, they may yep. think they're okay, but in fact, they're more impatient. You have more issues, interpersonal issues um, in the workplace. They tend to be less, in, in, <laughs> sorry, they tend to be less effective at what they're doing, it takes them longer to do what they need to do. You find that there's memory loss. So it's like, oh my gosh, I had that meeting and now I'm running 10 minutes late. Or I had that deadline and I still didn't, don't have that piece of information that I need. Yeah. yeah. So the impact on financial stress in the workplace uh, yeah. comes out in many different ways. It's, it's interesting um, in, in what you've described there because uh, I was just thinking of my own experience where I've been in situations where I know um, you, people ask, particularly at the moment, they're asking, oh, have you got any holidays planned? So they want to talk about holidays. They want to talk where, about where they've been and where they're going. And we can be in a working environment. And, and I've been there where I thought, I can't plan any holidays. I just don't have enough to, to be able to, you know, spend on a holiday. Uh, I've got other challenges coming up that I need to focus on. And so I felt in myself um, a little bit awkward, as if I really 
didn't want to be in the room at that point in time. I wanted to be somewhere else or engaged in a different type of, uh, of conversation. And I can well imagine um, going back to my own experience of indebtedness, how people would talk about something they've bought or um, they're moving to a bigger house or going on holiday. And, uh, and I would be just very quiet because in myself, I could feel myself almost like dying, really. It was like, a, it's very hard to sort of put words on it, but it felt very, very difficult, very hard to, to be in that room and to maintain um, an attitude that um, was m rational rather than running with my emotions of how I felt. And, uh -huh. um, and I, can, I can think how it must feel for other people who they, they aspire, there's lots of dreams and aspirations they may have in life, but circumstances have overtaken them. And it's not necessarily always their fault that this has happened, um, but they're in the midst of their circumstances. And yet people sometimes, if they're unaware of that, will just like to talk about the things they're interested in without realizing this person actually right now would rather not be in the conversation and rather be somewhere else. And, um, and we, don't, we, we don't pick up on those things, but also at the same time, um, we've, we struggle to say because money is one of those taboo subjects, isn't it? And as you're talking there, even yeah. in the workplace, you can see why people might just go quiet because they, they don't want to mention something that um, they feel uncomfortable about or they're worried what might people think of them. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I, I don't know in the UK, but in a lot of places in the US, uh, you actually are not allowed to share what you earn with other people. Um, really? Is, it, is person, that a rule? Is that it's, a not, rule? it's not an across the board rule, but there are certain, place, certain companies, certain school systems where you're not allowed to say, you're not allowed to share that information. I think that's changing, um, yeah. but in many ways, we we really reinforce that talking about money is is a bad thing, and some of us were raised where we had no money. So talking about money brings you're never talking about money. Money's a neutral neutral topic, right? <laughs> we're always talking about what are our associations with money, and and your example of you know talking about vacations. If you grew up where you didn't have any money. And a big vacation was maybe um, going to a park that was an hour away and bringing a picnic lunch. Yeah. And that was all that your family could afford or would choose to do. Then you're, you're bringing that with you. And yes, it could, unless you have really amazingly strong self-esteem, it's really hard to be a part of that when other people are talking about, you know, going abroad and, and doing lots of really interesting kinds of things but on the other hand people who are really wealthy yeah they also have a lot of issues <clears throat> because then you start worrying a lot of the times parents give you the message of don't ever talk about money because if people think you have money they might use you they may abuse you um they may like you because they think you can do something for them not because they actually like you right yeah and yeah. teenagers, surprisingly, I was surprised by this, teenagers are actually more private and will talk less about money than adults because now you're not only talking about what the, the student, the adolescent has, you're also talking about what reflects on their family, right? right. So adolescents are even more private when it, when it comes to this. But wow. the way that, the thing that's important is that we get to choose now how we want to manage our money. We get to choose now what we're going to do. If we're not aware, for example, of what those messages are that are in our head, some people call them scripts, um, then we're going to automatically do that. So I know people who will automatically spend, they'll go into debt to go on a vacation. Yeah. Because that's what they think they're supposed to do, and they don't realize what they're giving up. 
And until they realize why they're doing it, maybe they're doing it to please their spouse um, who doesn't care about money, right? It's really important for people to know where they're coming from before yeah. they can make changes. And again, we do things so automatically that we don't question it. And if we want to be in control, we need to know what those messages are that are influencing us. And that's actually when I developed Money Habitudes, I developed it for two reasons. One was, as you said, money is the most difficult topic to talk about because we're never talking about money. Um, and I wanted to make it easy. And typically when people think about money, they have so many associations, but a lot of them are really negative and they feel shame, they feel anger, they feel like they were left out, they weren't lucky or whatever. Yeah. Um, and sometimes people weren't good in school, they weren't good with numbers and they think about that, right? So when I created Money Habitudes, I wanted to do it in a way that people wouldn't feel that way. They, that they could just talk about stuff. There's no jargon, there's no numbers. It's kind of like, what's your, what's your story? What's your experience? Here's yeah. different ways to bring that up. Yeah. And then the other thing, reason that I developed Money Habitudes was that I wanted people to get some insight. Like, why are they doing some things that they go, why did I do that? I know better than that. I've done that 10 times before. Why did I do that again? I didn't want to do that. Or I'd like to be more generous. Um, why, why can't I just share some money with my children? Uh, why can't I help out a friend? And I'm, why do I hold, money on, hold on to money so tightly? So that's, that was my two reasons for developing Money Habitudes. Initially, it was only available as a card game. Because yeah. most people like cards. It's a social activity. They relax. There's no winners in this one. There's no losers. When you do it as a couple, you could see where you fit together. And yeah. a lot of times where people have conflict is where they're also balancing each other. It's interesting. Okay? You, you, you mentioned couples because I really, I was waiting for the moment to, because I wanted to bring <laughs> that one up. Because I know that you also do work around, um, you know, the uh, couples and relationships. And, and we know, I mean, in this country, one in four relationships break down because of money conflict. And um, and so that that's a huge number. And so in terms of habitude, you, I love it. I, uh, I did the card game to start with, and it's kind of fun, really, uh, doing that. And you're right. I, you don't feel anything in terms of, if you've got the notion that you are no good with numbers um, or, you know, I'm not good with money or whatever you, you think. Actually, that doesn't come into play in terms of when you're doing the, doing, doing the cards. It's just interesting to see what happens, what, what's, what's going to transpire at the end of it. Um, and then that's when the conversations start about, oh, I didn't realise that. I didn't realise that's how I tend to behave. And um, But equally in relationships, I don't uh, a lady who she did the uh, habitudes assessment and it, it quite blew her away really in terms of what it showed her um, and I love the fact that it's always the positive em emphasis and the things that might challenge us these are the kind of things you can do to um, actually improve in those areas or utilize those areas more um, that you're not utilizing at that moment and she was really taken aback by this. So she says, can I get my partner to do this? And so she did. And, uh, and I said to her in the end, I said, why, why was that so important to you that you and your partner did this? And she said, when I first met him, uh, he was the most generous person going. I loved that about his nature, his character. But when we came together, she said it was the most frustrating part about his character. <laughs> and she was saying, why can't he be more like me? And she said, when we did the assessment, suddenly I realized actually what we both carry. And, and you said uh, how it sort of almost like for me dovetails together uh, mm -hmm. to create almost like a whole. Um, that was very interesting and very uh, enlightening to have that experience. I mean, what just tell us a little bit more about 
your thoughts around the, um, the the relationship. Why it's important for people not only to understand themselves, but in doing so, then able to understand perhaps other people. Okay. So everybody has heard that money is the number one cause of conflict in a relationship and the number one cause of divorce. And I have to tell you, I 100% disagree with that. Money is never the cause of divorce. Money is never the cause of conflict or very rarely. It is always what money means to us. And if people argue about the credit card bill, if they argue about how much they're going to spend on a house and they keep it at that level, they're yeah. never going to get anywhere. But if they go beyond that to tell me more about you want this house that has a huge mortgage on it, what does it mean to you to live in a house like that? Why is, you know, I don't like asking the question why that puts people on the defensive, but how is that important? What, it, what does it mean? Tell me more about that versus, you know, you, you want to stay in this really modest house in this neighborhood where you grew up and what, what, what is there about that? Why is that so important to you, right? If you don't get beyond that, um, I've had therapists and I've had um, people who do marriage enrichment programs, divorce programs, people literally come into these programs intending to get divorced. And after they've done money habitudes, they say, oh, we thought we were arguing about money. Now that we understand what the other person's perspective is and how we fit together, how we can leverage those strengths, yeah. they choose not to get divorced. And typically what you have is somebody who tends to save and plan and uh, be very mindful about their money. And oftentimes what you see is that they're married to somebody who they couldn't tell you how much money they have in their pocket. They have no idea how much money they have in savings. They don't even know if they have any kind of retirement or, or pension plan, right? And it's like that causes so much tension yeah. so much conflict right but when you look at it together typically what you see is that the more one is in one direction with saving the more the other one is going to go in the other direction to bring that balance and yeah. typically that person who's who's saving money and being really careful they need somebody to help them lighten up and they need to appreciate that other person and the person who's complaining, you're cheap, you never want us to be able to do something, they need to have that aha moment of, wow, thank heavens we can do this stuff because I know this person is taking care of the foundation yeah. of our finances. And that person who's doing that, they have a responsibility on a regular basis to let the other person know where their money is, where their accounts are, what the codes are, and a sense of what it takes to run that household yeah. Um, yeah. in a month's time. And if money is needed in an emergency to know yeah. where that money, money is. And that person who says, I don't want to know about money, <laughs> that person needs to suck it up and say, I really don't care about this stuff. I don't want to hear it. But once a month or once every other month, I'm going to sit and listen. So at least I have a context uh, yeah. of what our financial life is like. Sybil, that, that is really helpful advice. And, I, and I, uh, I was smiling when you were describing that with regards to, you know, the, the relationship and, and the part that money plays in it. And I was thinking, you know, yes, I, I, I do like my gadgets. And uh, my <laughs> wife often <laughs> pulls me up on this. Why on earth have you bought this? What's, what good's that going to do? And, you know, I've always got a very valid reason. <laughs> but, um, but it's interesting. At least we talk about those things like you're encouraging us to do. Um, and, 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 and not be afraid, especially people who say, you know, I'm no good with figures or I'm bad with money. Do you know, I haven't found a single person who truly is bad with money in so much as um, couldn't um, find ways if they were taught how to handle it well. Um, and so, I, you know, it's just how we help people in their mindsets appreciate there's more to me than I even I realize. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and 
we're all adaptable. We can all develop and, uh, and adapt um, with the right kind of encouragement. So, Sybil, thank you so much for your, uh, for your time. What a pleasure it's been to be on your show. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's, it's up to, it, I, I would say the pleasure's mine. I've been looking forward to this conversation with you, and I love Money Habitudes. Um, in, in terms of, um, you know, if people have questions from this uh, podcast episode, um, how best could they um, get hold of you or, or communicate with you, perhaps, or if they've got a question of any kind? Yeah, the, the easiest way is go to our website. It's Money Habitudes. It's H-A-B-I-T-U-D-E-S, Habitudes, moneyhabitudes.com. And um, you're welcome to email me anytime. That's probably the most efficient way to get a hold of me. Happy to do Zoom calls. Happy to connect with you. Uh, and if you want to try the Money Habitudes, uh, you can do the online version. So you can purchase it at moneyhabitudes.com and you can immediately do that. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in doing the cards, it takes a while to get them to you uh, because they have to come across the pond and, you know, that takes a bit, but at money, ha at, at money there you go. Um, <laughs> I've just shown and, Sybil uh, the fact that I've got a pack of her uh, cards and I have actually done the card game as well as the online assessment. Right. And with the online, you get a report with it. Yeah. Um, with the cards, you also get interpretation, but you don't get the report. So, you know, some people love one, some love the other. Uh, but the important thing is that there's no judgment. There's no right money habitudes to have or no wrong money habitudes. It's just a matter of how is it working for you? If you're happy, that's great. If you are not happy with it, then you get to explore what your habits and attitudes are and how you can predict things so you can make the changes to take control of your money and your I life. Found, yeah, that's brilliant. And I found the report very, very helpful. And you've got some, um, you know, sort of pointers at the back of the report of things if you wanted to develop in an area. You mentioned earlier on about somebody who would say, I'd like to give more. Well, you've got some helpful tips on how they can, uh, you know, develop that side of their money habitudes so uh, in the report so that, that's excellent Sybil thank you so much uh, for being with me today um, I wish you all the best going forward it would be lovely to in in, in uh, time to be able to catch up with you again and perhaps just I would love that. explore some other subjects and other avenues around uh, money habitudes but uh, for now thank you so much thank you have a good day and you Thank you.